if you're sitting comfortably. <laughs> the final item of business today is members' business debate on motion number 13816 in the name of Murdo Fraser on Citizens Advice Scotland report. It's not fine. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I'd invite those members who wish to speak in the debate, please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Mr Fraser, if you are ready, I would call on you to open the debate. Um, a generous seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, thanking members from all different parties who uh, signed uh, my motion to allow this to be uh, debated and those who are staying behind to participate in or at least listen to the debate. And I appreciate that members who uh, intend to contribute may wish to talk about issues they've experienced within their own constituency or region, and I would encourage them to do so. I think it might be a useful starting point, Deputy Presiding Officer, to explain how I got involved in this particular issue. Since uh, April, my office has been inundated with letters, phone calls and emails from constituents who have been wrongly fined by a private car park in the centre of Perth. Uh, and since then, that has led to uh, an umbrella effect uh, uh, with many other uh, constituents uh, from other parts subsequently getting in touch when they've seen some of the press coverage that has resulted from that. And while the rules for parking on public land are, are well defined with local authorities, the rules for parking on private land are far less clear. The Canoole Street multi-storey car park in Perth is operated by Smart Parking Limited. It changed its operations uh, back in uh, the early part of the year to use number plate recognition software in addition to asking drivers to key in their registration plate details when paying for parking. As a result of both poor signage and an overly complicated payment process, the new system has caused a great deal of confusion. I have even been contacted by a former smart parking employee who has claimed that this new system was introduced deliberately by the company with the sole purpose of driving up revenue from fines. In addition to this, there have also been blatant errors whereby motorists have been fined despite having correctly paid for parking. I can testify to this myself, Deputy Presiding Officer. I myself was the victim of an incorrectly Jeez. issued Jeez. parking notice. Fortunately, fortunately, I had retained proof of payment and was ever ever successfully to challenge it, but shouldn't, of course, have had to go through that trouble at all in the first place as the figures were correctly paid for the period in which I was parked. Incorrectly issuing fines is simply not good enough when one considers the mechanisms and the tactics some of these companies use to elicit payment. A number of constituents have contacted my office in great distress after receiving intimidating letters from debt collectors threatening increased fines, expensive court action or a poorer credit rating following non-payment. And as a result of these bully boy tactics, a number of older and vulnerable residents have paid up despite uh, not, in fact, uh, being due to do so, having correctly paid for parking. This is not on. Citizens Advice Scotland received nearly 4,000 calls to their helpline in 2013-14 in relation to private parking issues, up a remarkable 50% on the previous year. A further 15,000 people have also used their website to access information on the laws governing parking tickets on private land. Despite the large number of complaints involved, it would appear that the vast majority of private parking companies operate well and operate within uh, the regulations and the code of conduct by the British Parking Association. As three quarters of all queries to citizens' advice relate to just 15 firms. I'd like to take this opportunity to put on record my thanks to Citizens Advice Scotland for their role in increasing awareness among motorists of their rights as a result of their It's Not Fine uh, campaign. Knowing both your rights and obligations when parking on private land is a must, and I would encourage drivers across the country to consult with the help pages on the Citizens Advice Scotland website. In July, Citizens Advice Scotland released an important addition to their It's Not Fine campaign, and that was a report with a detailed legal opinion on the rules for challenging a privately issued parking ticket in Scotland. This legal advice has made it crystal clear that parking companies can only issue fines that are commensurate with the losses they have incurred as a result of a driver 
overstaying their welcome. So, for example, if parking costs £1 an hour, but you're then issued with a fine of £60, you'd have to be parked there for 60 hours in order to justify the charge. And to put this into context, smart parking in Perth, which I referred to earlier, regularly issues penalty notices of £160. And I'm aware of one case of an individual being charged as much as £200 when an unpaid charge has been passed to debt collectors. Now, in no way am I suggesting that people shouldn't pay for their parking. Having a car park is legitimate business and provides a vital uh, local service, and those who provide that service are entitled to be remunerated for it. But what is, I think, to be disputed is uh, the abuse of the privileges of ownership by some private car parking owners. Of course. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. I, just, uh, I wondered if Murdo Fraser would agree with me, though, that it's not always uh, car parks that park. Actually, it's often for just going a little bit over time limits, for example, when people receive these so-called fines, which are actually charges. Mr. Fraser. Yes, I'm very happy to agree with that point from, from Elaine Smith, and that is exactly the case many of my constituents have found themselves in, where even just a few minutes over their allocated time, they're hit with a £60 fine, which escalates up uh, sometimes as high as £160 if they don't pay it, which is clearly a disproportionate. And people in that case should consult the legal advice from Citizens Advice Scotland, which makes it quite clear that such penalties are disproportionate and therefore are not uh, legally uh, enforceable. There's another issue with car park operators needing to make the terms of parking as clear as possible, because this is a matter of contract law. When you enter a car park, uh, it, is, it needs to be made clear the terms and conditions on which you are to be charged. And too many cases uh, exist of incoherent signs or illegible small print, which means that people are not clear as to their rights. And there does appear to be a serious disconnect between the practice of some private car parks and the code of conduct created by the British Parking Association, which is very fair, but clearly is not being met in many cases. I think there needs to be fairness and transparency for both car park operator and for motorist. So, for example, we see many private car parking firms calling their fines parking charge notices, which is obviously similar to penalty charge notices issued by local authorities, and which, of course, do have legal standing. Blurring the lines between public and private would appear to be a tool that is used all too frequently by some private car park operators. Now, the authorities in Scotland have a strong record when it comes to legislating for private car parks, with Scotland being the first country in the UK to outlaw private clampers. There have been a number of calls from Citizens Advice Scotland around the establishment of a fair and independent appeals process, similar to England and Wales, uh, and also asking the Scottish Government to look at establishing a mandatory register of fit and proper companies to operate car parks. But my ask today is a much more simple one, and that is uh, around the Scottish Government doing what they can to clarify the law around uh, parking in private car parks so people are better aware of their rights. Because I think increasing awareness for motorists will ensure that fewer people are duped into paying incorrectly issued tickets and will also help drivers recognise their obligations when privately parking. And doing so has the power to cut down on confusion and frustration for both car park operators and for motorists. Presiding officer, I would close by again commending Citizens Advice Scotland for their work in this area. Better informed consumers and drivers will be well placed to fight their corner against unscrupulous car park operators. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Elaine Smith, a generous four minutes. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Murdo Fraser on securing this debate. I had a similar motion myself, repeating uh, congratulations to CAS uh, for their report. I thank members who signed my motion as well. Obviously, I'm going to try not to replicate some of the points raised by Murdo. It will be a wee bit difficult, but I try. This first came to my attention some years ago when substantial retail developments took place in Gala Shields as the Walmart, Tesco, Marks and Spencers and Next all came to town. 
Local people in Gala Shields were quite unfamiliar with being charged for parking at what they consider local shops, quite rightly, and quite a few were caught out in the early months, and I dealt with many of the cases. And like Murdo Fraser, people generally come to you at the end of the road when they're receiving threatening letters and they're just about to pay up, and then they came maybe because they didn't have the money, some had already done it, and I did what I could for them. One of the first things I raised with them, this is not a criminal matter. This was a matter of contract, and in contract, it has to be clear to you you're entering a contract, and that's why it should be that the notice displayed as you go in should be, and Murdo Fraser, no doubt, correct me from his legal days, an invitation to treat. It's an offer that this will be the price of doing it, and I've got an example which is from the CAS uh, report of one notice which is clear, the big one about the P on it, and then tells you, and the other one's all cluttered. And you're driving in. You're driving in past this, so you may not see it. So, yes, indeed, yes. Many thanks. Just on that point, though, I wonder if you might agree with me that the only way to actually make it clear that you're renting a contract is if there's a barrier. I, I don't know whether a barrier would be, in fact, physically possible in some of the supermarkets I'm going into. They're terribly busy, but I do think they must be displayed very, very clearly. And one of the victories we had was with one of the shopping uh, areas where the notices were very small and people were unaware. There was one little notice as they drove in and we were successful in rebutting uh, the fees that were being asked for. You must know that you're entering into a contract or ought to know you're entering into a contract. And what also makes it difficult for people is they get referred to as charges, and I use that in inverted commas, because it's not, it's a fee. You are pay, giving part of the contract says you can stay here for two hours or three hours free. After that, there will be a fee, there will be a payment that you'll have to make for pay, staying after that period. And you're quite right, it should be commensurate with what would be a, a reasonable charge for staying there. Another important thing is that these parking firms access, some of them are on a register and entitled to access the DVLA to obtain the name of the registered owner. Well, one of the rebuttals for being liable is that you weren't the driver of the car. I'm not suggesting that people should always say they weren't driving the car, but it is the driver of the car who entered into the contract not the registered owner who cannot have seen the notice in the first place. And I know again that I had a success with a constituent in that area, but still many people think that they have committed an offence and it's not all their own doing because of the language that is being used and I'm being kind to some of the companies because I think they deliberately use that language. If you look at what happens in the public parking areas where there is legislation, it's statutory, and it is a criminal offence, the fees are quite clear. The charges, I should say, are quite clear. Usually it's £60, maybe with a £30 if you stump up, as some of us had to do. I once was five minutes over speaking to the tax man in George Street. I'll never forgive him because he cost me £60 just for telling me something. For I beg your pardon? I didn't set it against my tax from a sedentary <laughs> intervention. But one of the other issues is there's no right of appeal. If you, if you appeal, you're appealing to the very people who are putting this alleged charge on you. So I very much agree with uh, Murdo uh, Fraser that I hope the uh, minister will consider regulating, consider regulating this through legislation so that we all know where we are, that the parking companies know where they are and the public know where they are, and it's clear there are limits on the, on the amount that is paid for excessive staying, that there is, a third, there is a right of appeal to a third party, and that you have mitigation because there are circumstances where people have been unable to access, say, I've got mitigating reasons why I was 10 or 15 minutes over. Finally, before all that happens, I think there's an obligation on the supermarkets and the major retailers to take some responsibility for what happens to their customers and not just to leave it to these other companies, often uh, coming from south, the south or from London, issuing their, uh, um, their letters from the south in London, to take it upon, not them, but they are not aware of Scots law, but to take it upon themselves to say, this isn't fair to our customers. I'm going to intervene here on behalf of Mr and Mrs X. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now call on Elaine Smith, after which moves to the closing speech from the Minister. A generous four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too congratulate Murdo Fraser 
on bringing this debate to the Chamber. It is an issue that is, of course, very important to many people in Scotland, including hundreds of my constituents who have sought my help with these unfair charges. Actually, I was intending to lodge a motion myself um, to try and get a debate on it myself, so I am really pleased that not only has Murdo Fraser brought it forward, but that I am not on the chairing rota for tonight and I can actually participate in the debate. Um, can I can also just say that my colleague Cara Hilton also had a motion on the issue, I think entitled uh, something along the lines of it is not fine as well. Um, I first became aware of these parking issues a number of years ago and I myself have lodged motions, I have written multiple letters and I have represented hundreds of constituents over the years. And last year I also campaigned on the issue in conjunction with the Coatbridge Community Forum who were handing out leaflets on the matter to my constituents. Actually, as far back as 2009, I lodged a motion in the Parliament entitled Highway Robbery about these charges because I believe it's exactly what many of these companies are doing. Dick Turpin hasn't got a look in. And I would also like to congratulate um, the Citizens Advice Bureau on their campaign to raise awareness on the issue, as noted in Murdo Fraser's motion, um, and also for the helpful legal advice that they, they've issued on the matter. I have got a close relationship with my local CAB and they refer people to me maybe because my office is just round the corner and I am very happy then to write to the private companies on behalf of uh, my constituents and I will come back to this but I will give some examples of the issues first. Many of the people who approach my office are elderly and are maybe disabled whose blue badges have fallen off the dashboard or they have been placed upside down. They are receiving charges. Um, as I alluded to in my earlier intervention, I have also had a number of cases where people have been issued charges from car parks with a time limit because they have left the car park and gone back maybe later in the day after shopping elsewhere. Inevitably, these people have spent a great deal of money in the local shops, so there is definitely no loss to traders involved. And actually, some shoppers from outside my constituency have contacted me to say that they are never going to shop in our retail parks again. So actually these parking restrictions and charges can themselves lead to a loss of town centre trade, thus affecting uh, the local economy in places like Coatbridge. And I also had a woman approach me for help because she'd been out shopping. She spent quite a bit of time in the supermarket whose car park she was in. And on her return to the car, she had to breastfeed her baby. That then took her over the time limit and she got sent one of these uh, charges. So all of these people, old, young, mothers, disabled, are then harassed by the parking companies and debt collecting agencies. And as Murdo Fraser said earlier, they often feel bullied into paying the charges. Now, I've written personally to a number of different companies for hundreds of constituents, and the responses vary. Some cancel the charge, some say they'll reduce the charge, some ignore my letters, and I've even had a response where a company has cancelled the charge but asked my disabled constituent, whose badge was upside down, it was on the dashboard, but it was upside down, to pay a £15 donation to disabled charities. Well, that's unacceptable, and not least because companies can use those kind of charitable donations then to claim tax relief. Elderly people in particular, I have found, don't feel comfortable ignoring the letters that arrive from these parking companies, and they're comforted when I write on their behalf, and they're relieved, very relieved, if the charges are then cancelled. Now, I represent a constituency with high levels of poverty and deprivation, and I feel really angry that my constituents are receiving these charges in the first place, and then they're worrying about them. On a lot of cases, they're just paying out the money that they can ill afford. And just with the intervention I made earlier, given that it's contract law, I think it would be very difficult for uh, the companies to prove a case in court, actually no matter the signage, because how do you prove that people have actually read the signs no matter what size they are? So that brings me then to an issue actually reserved to Westminster, but relevant to this debate, which Christine Graham touched on, and that involves the release of driver's details from the DVLA to some of these private companies. Not only is this concerning um, with regard to data protection, but reports last year show it's also costing the taxpayer money. A subsidy apparently arises due to the private firms paying £2.50 for documentation, but that costs the DVLA £2.84 to process. So last year, the agency received 1.8 million applications from private companies, which therefore cost the public purse around £612,000. So it's costing us public money to help these private parking, parking companies harass and extort money from our constituents. That just cannot be right. So just before concluding, presiding officer, can I say I think it's important to be clear that I don't condone irresponsible parking causing a danger to other road users or pedestrians. 
I don't condone selfish parking across two bays, stopping others getting a space. And I certainly don't condone ignorant people parking in disabled bays when they're not disabled or in parent and child bays without children. But I think there are ways which shopping centres or supermarkets could deal with that without employing companies who then, uh, who then harass their customers, as Christine Graham mentioned. President officer, I'll continue to fight for the many constituents in Coatbridge and Crescent affected by these private parking companies, but it really is about time it was stopped. I congratulate Murdo Fraser in raising this important issue and the Citizens Advice Bureau for their work, and I really hope that these highway robbers can be stopped in their tracks because it really isn't fine. Thank you. Thanks very much. I now call Minister Derek Mackay. Minister, seven minutes or thereby. Thanks Thank very you. much, Presiding Officer. I was just um, wondering when Elaine Smith was speaking, as Murdo Fraser and Christine Graham had done, confessed that their motivation was altruistic, the interests of their constituents, and that's very fair and accurate. OK, I'll give way. Elaine Smith. Thank the Minister for giving way. Actually, one of the first cases I had was... Uh, my mother and my stepfather, one had parked early in the day because they only have the one car, one had gone down later and then they received one of these so-called fines and were very upset about it. So that was one of the first cases I dealt with. Minister. So, presiding officer, there we have it. That's three out of three speakers so far affected by this issue. And can I make it four? Because I too have been subject, <laughs> uh, as a passenger, of course, uh, to someone incurring an excessive and unfair a fine at the time. So that's a 100% record of members motivated uh, on this issue. Not, of course, through self-interest at all. The Citizens Advice Scotland uh, report is accurate in, I think, revealing uh, an issue that is there. This is not about irresponsible parking. We'll return to that matter, of course, uh, in the very near future, and I'll have a, a, an imminent uh, position uh, on that uh, to share, but this is about irresponsible charging uh, for parking, in which there is an undoubtedly uh, an issue. Elaine Smith just said it should stop and it should stop now. I agree if I had a magic button to press it would make it so, uh, I would uh, press it, but it is more complicated than a simple change in the law. I am working with the operators on a partnership basis to impress upon them the concerns that have been raised before um, and uh, assisted with the Citizens Advice Report and, of course, the experiences uh, of members uh, uh, in the Chamber and, of course, out with, who have given me many case examples of how uh, the unfair application of a charging regime has impacted on constituents. There are legal issues here, some devolved, some uh, reserved. In terms of Murdo Fraser's plea for clarity in the law and raising awareness, of course I can commit to that, yes, but I don't think that in itself will go far enough uh, to resolve the issue. I think I'll need a stronger approach than just that, although I have, uh, through officials, uh, had the message shared with the operators that I expect action to be taken around transparency, signage, uh, stopping excessive uh, charging uh, and other matters, but to Christine Graham's request specifically for legislative um, action and uh, stronger um, regulations around that, then yes, that is being explored at the moment, and I may well have to regulate our proposed regulation, uh, maybe a future parliament that is the, the time to consider this, if the current uh, approach is not satisfactory, and I fear that because of the actions of the minority, as members have described, then it may well be um, required. And it is disappointing to hear that some uh, private businesses, because that's essentially what they are, are acting out with the spirit um, of what well, is fair, of course. Christine Graham. Uh, I'm gratified to hear that uh, the Minister is actually considering perhaps regulating. I won't put it any stronger than that, as he hasn't. But in the meantime, the right of appeal, either not to have to pay this or have mitigation, is that being dealt with? Because if that were there, then we wouldn't have people having to go to their MSP or Citizens Advice Scotland. It, yes, I mean, it may well be in place at the moment, but it is, as Christine Graham has described, both... Uh, uh, vo voluntary and not particularly effective as well sometimes because who regulates those who are making the decisions? Of course, there's a different position south of the border in terms of the independent appeal service, and that's also something that's been explored at the moment um, for uh, Scotland, but that would require a change in position to make sure that that was enforceable here. As I say, it's a partnership voluntary approach I don't think is working, and that's why I am having to consider reg regulations and legislation as appropriate um, going forward. But it would be better if the operators just acted more 
um, responsibly and fairly and consistently across the country. I have the full, of course. Mr. Fraser. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving way. I mean, uh, you'll be aware of the British Parking Association Code of Conduct. Would you agree with me that if all companies actually followed that to the, to the letter and the spirit, in fact, we wouldn't need to go further with regulation? Yes, I would. And we could also have further progress on capping of fines and charges as well. And if we removed the bad practice of pretending that the statutory penalties, that would address another issue. If we had better signage, that would address the contract issue. So there are a range of things that could be done on a voluntary basis. My difficulty as Minister is, if they don't volunteer to do it, what are we left with? And it is legislation and regulation, uh, because our fair approach with them hasn't translated into a fair approach with their customers and people they've entered into a, a contract with. So uh, I'll take one more and then I can finally make progress on my con. Thank you very much, Minister, for taking the intervention. I wonder if, I know it's not your responsibility, but I wonder if you have an opinion at all on the DVLA handing out these number plates um, so that these companies can actually harass and send debt collectors to people. Well, there are, there are, of course, a number of issues there, but basically if conditions are kept to in terms of responsible use of that, people operating as per the Code of Conduct, having a, an independent appeal service, there's a range of things that were in place and that would be the responsible thing to do, arbitrarily issuing that information for people to be hounded unfairly and given the impression that they've broken the law, I don't agree with. So if the whole code was kept with, if companies were acting ethically and responsibly, then I would have more comfort uh, around that particular issue. And that's why I'm taking a look at the very complex issue for the reasons it's given. Every member has given an accurate um, appraisal of how their constituents have been uh, affected. And I think that's why we have to look very closely at what Parliament uh, will be uh, able to do. But I do want to send a strong message again as Minister clear signage, fair approach, consistent approach, treating people reasonably, not pretending this is a statutory breach of law and therefore folk will face all sorts of penalties should they not comply, um, capping at a reasonable level the fine, acknowledging the Citizens Advice Scotland uh, guidance as well, and I think we'll move forward to ensure that people are treated more fairly, which is the essence of the Citizens Advice Scotland campaign. I, have ca of course, cannot, as Scottish Government, as Minister, say don't pay the fine. That would not be responsible for me to take that message. But if people have checked their legal rights and responsibilities, many will realise they have not breached uh, what they think they may have breached. And therefore, my advice is absolutely check your rights, check the law, seek representation uh, and do the right thing. And certainly on the part of Scottish Government, we'll take on board all the comments from today, convey that to all the operators and then strive to have that more fairer, transparent and reasonable approach so that no one is unfairly charged uh, to the point that causes them both uh, anxiety and financial loss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you all for taking part in this debate. I now suspend, I now close this meeting of Parliament. Thank you.